Good evening. My name is Nancy Dalfors, and I'm a member of the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation Board. This is a library live program organized and presented by the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation. Our programs are funded entirely with private contributions from sponsors and library foundation members. Without support from the foundation members and sponsors, programs like this simply aren't possible. Thank you to all the foundation members out in the audience tonight, and please be sure to read the list of the names of our generous Library Live sponsors on the rack card that was placed on your chair. If you're not a member yet, please join our ranks tonight by visiting our membership table. Membership perks include advance notice of our programs, ticket discounts, and the joy of knowing that you are supporting the highest rated library in Southern California. Great. Following the program, there'll be a coffee rep reception out in the courtyard and book sales and signings right here with our very own Lido Village Books. So on to Mr. Tobbs. Gary Tobbs is a nutrition expert whose writing and lectures are based on years of research. He educates audiences about why it is not just how much we eat, but what we eat that affects our health. He is the only print journalist to have won three science and society journalism awards and he is the author of three critically acclaimed books, Good Calories, Bad Calories, Why We Get Fat, and The Case Against Sugar. In 2012, Mr. Tobbs co-founded NUSI, Nutrition Science Initiative, with the mission to reduce the individual social and econo economic costs of obesity, diabetes, and their related diseases by improving the quality of science in nutrition and obesity research. Tonight's topic is Mr. Tobbs' latest book, The Case Against Sugar. This book came from his 2002 New York Times Magazine cover story, What If It's All Been a Big Fat Lie? Through his, right. Through his research, Gary Tobbs shakes up our preconceptions about diet and health, and he challenges scientific studies that have been misinterpreted and prescribed as advice for the general public for years. He offers instead new ways to eat, live, and think about health based on the highest caliber of scientific research. Please welcome Mr. Tobbs. Hi, thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's an amazing library. I'm, uh, in theory, I have a, uh, a lavalier, so I'm waiting for it to come on. It's not working? Okay, we're gonna find out. Now we're gonna get it from both. Better, okay. So, hey, I was just saying, I, this was a lead up. I'm a, it's a pleasure to be here. I think it's an amazing library. I currently live in Oakland, and we don't, our library is not this nice. Um, so, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, and uh, rather than give a lecture, just sort of explain kind of how I got here and why I did this book and then a little bit about the book and then I want to do a little bit of a reading also. Um, but one of the first issues is I'm not a doctor, I'm not a PhD, I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not a dietitian. I'm a journalist, okay? I'm a journalist with a hard science background. Um, I studied physics at Harvard. I got a C- in quantum physics. <laughs> And my advisor politely suggested I find another career. <laughs> and I had read all the president's men. And like many young men in the 70s, wanted to become an investigative reporter, so I did. Um, and uh, when I got out of journalism school at Columbia, I couldn't, um, I couldn't get any other jobs uh, because I hadn't actually written for any newspaper. So the only job I could get was in science because I had this physics degree from Harvard, meaningless as it was because I was a lousy student. <laughs> so I took a job as a science writer with Discover Magazine in New York in the 19, early 1980s. And I very quickly realized that there was a call for investigative science journalism. And um, just as there are good doctors and bad doctors and good plumbers and bad plumbers and good lawyers and bad lawyers. There are good scientists and bad scientists. And um, science is one of these things where it's very easy to make mistakes. My favorite line about science, which was said by the Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, he said, the first principle is you must not fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. 
And my first book, and this is relevant, I went to, uh, I had been writing about a physicist at the Center for European, uh, nu nuclear research, European Nuclear Research, CERN, outside of Geneva. And this was a fellow who taught at Harvard and worked in Geneva and came from Italy and everyone knew he was going to win the Nobel Prize for work he had already done. And I had done a profile of him and then he came to New York in 19, came to Washington in 1984 to American Physical Association Conference and he said he was on to the biggest breakthrough in science in 50 years and all he had to do was turn on his accelerator and get a little more data and nail it down. And I asked him if I could go and live with him, at, live with his physicists at this laboratory outside of Geneva and document this breakthrough. It would be an opportunity to write a book like The Double Helix without having to be as smart as one of the researchers, in that case, Crick or Watson. So he said yes, and I moved off, got a book deal, and I moved off to Geneva, and I moved into the hostel on the laboratory. In today's language, I was embedded with the physicists, and it was very quickly became apparent that this discovery that this physicist had claimed was very likely wrong. And in fact, there were sort of the experiment itself, there are 150 physicists on this experiment and they had divided into sort of two groups. There were the guys who were older physicists who had built the equipment, who were very much sort of brick and mortar type, you know, guys, and they were all too aware of how their equipment could fool themselves and fool them. And then there were these young hotshots from Harvard and Stanford and Berkeley who had come over to work with this Nobel laureate physicist who just wanted to do the analysis and had never built the equipment themselves. And I was living in the midst of them and I realized that the guys who built the equipment didn't believe the discovery and the guys who had joined later did. And I realized that in order to understand what was happening in science, you had to talk to everyone. It wasn't good enough to talk to the Nobel laureate who was flying around the world claiming that he had discovered these new particles. You had to talk to the people who had actually built the equipment. And in fact, one of the Nobel laureates I interviewed while I was doing that book, turned out a lot of these people didn't like the guy I was writing about. <laughs> so they were more than happy to talk to me when I said I was writing a book about him and I wanted to delve into his history. And one of them was a, a guy named uh, Leon Letterman who had won the Nobel Prize and was running the Fermi National Laboratory outside Illinois. And Leon told me that he liked to walk around the laboratory at night and talk to the graduate students because they hadn't learned how to lie yet. And that's a direct quote, and that was in the book. And so that became sort of my mode. I, this book ended up being an expose about the politics and science of nuclear, uh, uh, excuse me, high energy physics and about how hard it is to do science right. And this became my obsession. Um, in fact, when my book came out, I mean, this was February 1987, I was living in New York and I the New York Post did an article about it. I don't know if you guys know that page six is the gossip page in the New York Post. And I was told that page six was doing something about it. I was 29 years old. And um, I went out on a snowy day in New York and I picked up the paper at six in the morning and I still remember standing under the scaffolding with snow everywhere and sleet coming down. And I opened page six and the headline is Egghead Squabble Over Nobel Prize. And in it, this Nobel laureate is calling me an asshole. <laughs> and I thought, of course, I'll never work in this business again. It's over. I'm done. But it turned out that every time I interviewed someone, they would say, oh, well, you think this guy Carlo Rubio was wrong, was bad. You should write about so-and-so. <laughs> and there's somebody like him in every field of science who is so ambitious that they just cut enough corners. They don't actually commit fraud but they don't do the hard, rigorous work necessary to get the right answer. So I started doing these exposés on various fields, and then I, I was actually living in L.A. trying to make it as a screenwriter when something called Cold Fusion happened. And Cold Fusion was this great scientific fiasco of the uh, late 1980s, and my editors called me up and said, do you want to do a book about Cold Fusion? And I said, well, I've got two screenplays I want to write, but I need some money to do it, so... Yeah, sure, I'll do the book and it'll take nine months and then I'll get back to screenwriting. And the book ended up taking me three years and by the time I was done, I owed my father $40,000 and I had married a New Yorker and moved to New York and my screenwriting career was over and the book got good reviews. So I was stuck in science journalism. 
I interviewed 300 people for this book, and I, uh, one of my favorite lines was from this great uh, historian of science, Horace Freeland Judson, who said, you did the most research for the stupidest scientific subject. <laughs> but again, I felt like in order to understand it, I had to interview not just the scientists, but the graduate students, and if there was a janitor who went into a laboratory that was relevant, I was going to find him and talk to him. So when I was done with that book, I was, that book's title was Bad Science. And my friends, I had a lot of friends and fans in the physics community who said, if you want to really fascinate it with bad science, you should look at the stuff in public health. It's terrible. So I moved into public health. This is the early 90s. And everything I had learned in the harder sciences and physics that you had to do to minimize the chance that you would fool yourself was considered a luxury that they couldn't afford to do in public health because public health research is too hard to do. If you're not dealing with infectious diseases like the Zika virus or AIDS or something like that, if you're dealing with chronic diseases, you're dealing with diseases that, that slowly develop over decades. And you can't really test your hypotheses very well. You can't do experiments where you take 50,000 people and randomize 25,000 to one diet and 25,000 to another and keep them on the diets for 20 years to see if one of them gets more heart disease than the other. So what they had done in this field of public health, and particularly nutrition, is realizing that they can't actually do these rigorous methodical tests, they decided to lower the standards in the field and decide that they could believe that they were right, that they couldn't possibly be fooling themselves on something as important as diet and health. So through the 90s, I worked on these various subjects, um, did a, uh, a few seminal stories on the, the field of epidemiology in particular, which is a study of how chronic diseases or diseases spread in populations. And by the late 1990s, again, I was still living in Los Angeles. I was doing most of my work for the journal Science. I needed a paycheck. And I called my editor at Science and I said, I need a paycheck. Do you have a story I could turn over quickly so I can pay my rent? I was no longer screenwriting. That was, thank God. But I still need, so a, an article was coming out in the New England Journal of Medicine in two weeks um, on a dietary approach to prevent hypertension. It's called the DASH diet. Many of you might know about it today. So dietary approach to stop hypertension. It was coming out in the New England Journal. And what I didn't know is it had been leaked to science by a, a researcher. So when you do these stories, when you need a paycheck as a journalist, um, a one-page story would pay me about $1,500, and you interview three people you figure is reasonable for a one-page story. So you call up the principal investigator who did the research, and because this study hadn't been published yet, you have to ask him who else to talk to. So you get a list of people to interview who would know about the study, even though it hasn't been published yet, and then you interview them. But in this case, it had been leaked to science, and the person who leaked it to science also gave a list of subjects that I knew nothing about. All I knew is my editor said, here, write about this DASH study. It's coming out in the New England Journal of Medicine. Here's some people you could talk to about it. So I interviewed the principal investigator who told me about this study. And then I called one of the people on the list who happened to be a former president of the American Heart Association. And she refused to talk to me. She said, I can't talk to you. I'll lose my funding. And I said, Professor, this isn't the Lysenko era Soviet Union. People don't lose their funding for talking to a journalist about a diet study that's being published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And she said, I can't do it. And I said, well, let's go off the record, OK? Because if you don't do it, I won't know what bothers you about this study. Obviously, there's something disturbing here that I know nothing about. And if you don't tell me, I'll never know anything about it, and I'll screw up the story. And I said, we'll go off the record, no names, no my tape record, nothing. And she wouldn't talk to me. And then I called up one of the people that the uh, uh, principal investigator suggested I talk to. And I got him on the phone. And a little weird. He sounded exactly like Walter Matthau. <laughs> <laughs> and he started yelling at me that there was no controversy over salt and blood pressure, that there's no controversy. It's absolutely clear that salt causes high blood pressure. And I kept saying, but Professor, I'm not calling about salt and blood pressure. I'm calling about this dietary approach to stop hypertension. It's a low-fat diet. It's, um, th this dietary approach to stop hypertension lowered blood pressure more than a low-salt diet did. But it didn't restrict salt. 
So this was interesting. If you had questions about whether or not salt was a cause of hypertension, but I knew nothing about this. I just needed a paycheck. <laughs> so I turned in the story to my editor, and then I said, you know, look, I had this one former president of the American Heart Association refuse to talk to me, even off the record about a diet study. She said she'd lose her funding if she talked to me, and then I had this other guy yelling at me that there was no controversy over salt and high blood pressure. When I wasn't calling about salt, and high blood pressure. There clearly is a controversy over salt and high blood pressure that I know nothing about. And I'm gonna start investigating that. And they had enough faith in me that they said yes. So I spent the next nine months of my life, I interviewed 85 people for one magazine article. And it turns out that the evidence supporting the hypothesis that sodium is the cause of hypertension or the elevator of blood pressure is terrible. It was an interesting hypothesis that was floated in the 60s by researchers who couldn't believe that they could fool themselves. And when study after study after study refuted the hypothesis, they convinced themselves that they had done the study wrong. And while I was doing this, this fellow I had spoke to, the Walter Matthau character, was clearly one of the five worst scientists I'd ever interviewed in my life. And remember, I wrote a book called Bad Science. I thought I had interviewed some of the worst scientists in the world, and they were involved in this cold fusion stuff. This guy was down there. You couldn't say which was the worst. That was like, but you could say the, this is the bottom of the barrel. He took credit not just for getting Americans to eat less salt, but getting Americans to eat less fat. And when I got off the phone with him after that conversation, I said, called my editor, and I said, when I'm done doing this salt story, I'm going to do a fat story. I have no idea what this story is. I had no biases whatsoever other than this, which is what I had learned from the physicists in the 80s. Bad scientists never get the right answer. Nature is not kind enough. And I thought, if this guy is really involved in any substantive way, and he actually did not overestimate his contribution, underestimate his contribution, whatever you... Um, if he's involved in any substantive way, there's a story there. So I finished the SALT story. It was called The Political Science of SALT. It won me one of these National Association of Science Writers, Science and Society Awards. And I spent the next year of my life doing research on the dietary fat hypothesis. And we all grew up believing that. I believed at the time. The idea that a healthy diet is de facto a low-fat, low-saturated fat diet. How many of you believe that? I mean, you're Californians. It's like... <laughs> I was living in LA, I was probably eating, I don't know, 15% of my diet was fat. I mean, you know, skinless chicken breasts were the fattiest thing I ever ate. <laughs> now, anyway, the science is terrible. I don't know what to say. It's just, again, it was an interesting hypothesis that saturated fat raises LDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol is associated with an increased risk of heart disease. Therefore, if you eat saturated fat, you'll raise your heart disease risk. And study after study was done to test it, and it just didn't pan out. But, so anyway, I wrote that piece for science. Was also won me some awards. Um, while I was doing that, one of the, uh, I interviewed an administrator at the National Institutes of Health who said, yeah, it was really crazy. You know, in the mid-1980s, when we put everyone on this low-fat diet, we really didn't know whether dietary fat would cause heart disease because we couldn't do really the rigorous studies. But we thought it, would, it was making people fat. You know, if nothing else, fat has the densest calories in the diet. So you overeat it. If we get the fat out of the diet, people eat less and they'll weigh less and we'll bring obesity levels down. He said, but what happened is we have an obesity epidemic now that didn't exist until we started telling people to eat this low-fat diet. <laughs> so what they did is they started eating a lot of carbs instead. And I don't know if you, I mean, you guys, a lot of you probably remember, like baked potatoes in the 60s were fattening. And by the 80s, they became heart-healthy diet foods. You know, it was like the sour cream and the butter you didn't eat, but the baked potato was a diet food. Pasta in the 60s was something you might have one, like Thursday night was pasta night. And by the 80s, we were all eating pasta every night because everyone had their favorite pasta recipes. It was so easy to make, it's cheap. And this coincides with this obesity epidemic. So I wanted to write about that, and I had, by this time I had moved back to New York with my second wife, <laughs> who's I'm still married to. And I was introduced to an editor at the New York Times Magazine, and we both had a favorite French cafe in the village where we lived, and we would meet in this French cafe and discuss possible story ideas. I said, Let's, can we, let me do a story on what 
was the cause of the obesity epidemic. Because you can localize it in time from 1976 to about 1991 between these two big National Institutes of Health studies. And in that time period, there were two major changes to the American diet. So one is high fructose corn syrup came in, 1977, and by 1984 it had saturated our diets, um, replaced uh, sugar and Coca-Cola and Pepsi and virtually all um, sweeteners. And, and people like Michael Pollan and some other writers were suggesting that high fructose corn syrup was the cause of the obesity epidemic. And the other was that we had switched to this low, we had institutionalized this idea that a low-fat, high-carb diet is a healthy diet. And by, while we did that, sugar kind of got a benign pass in all this. So it's not that people said you should eat as much sugar as you want, but we never defined a healthy diet as a low-sugar diet. It was a low-fat diet and a low-salt diet, right? And then you ate sugar in moderation, whatever that means. And I'm serious about that. I mean, if you're overweight, whatever you're eating, by definition, is not moderation, if you believe in the concept of moderation. Um, so anyway, I did this story for the New York Times Magazine, and it was a cover story. It was called, What If It's All Been a Big Fat Lie? The cover photo, some of you might remember, was a porterhouse steak with a, the greasiest steak. The editor recently told me they'd gone out of their way to pick the, the, the ugliest, greasiest steak with butter on it. And it was seen as an apologia for the Atkins diet because it implied the Atkins diet is a diet that removes the carbohydrates and the sugars and replaces them with fat. And if you don't believe the fat's going to kill you, there's an argument to be made that an Atkins diet is a very healthy diet. But we're all trained to believe the fat is going to kill us. So this then, cover stories in the New York Times Magazine give you huge book advances um, if they're controversial. So I got a huge book advance and I thought finally I could write the book I've always wanted to write and not go into debt. My father by this time had passed away so there would be nobody to borrow money from. <laughs> um, the, uh, anyway, I got a big book advance. It paid for four years of my life. I spent five years on the book so I still went into debt. Um, and as I was doing the research, it turned out that there was, in effect, there had always been several alternative hypotheses to the belief system that our nutrition, obesity, diabetes researchers had embraced over the years. So the first idea that was this, the fundamental concept of all nutrition research is that we get fat because we eat too much that we take in more calories than we expend. And every one of you who goes to the gym and looks at the calorie count or on the elliptical machine believes that whether you think it or not. Um, it turned out, to go back to the pre-World War II era when the best medical research was done in Germany and Austria and America was basically a backwater of medical science. Um, the Germans and Austrians had concluded that obesity had to be a hormonal regulatory disorder. Just like fat people claimed, it's hormones. It is really hormones. It's like, why do men and women fatten differently? Because our hormones affect fat accumulation differently, you know? There's a, just a whole slew of arguments that this idea you get fat because you eat too much, you take in more calories than you expend, is about as useful as a theory of wealth that says you get wealthy because you make more money than you spend. <laughs> okay? I mean, they're exactly parallel. And yet, if I was talking about wealth and telling you the key to getting wealthy is making more money than you spend, you'd laugh me out of the room. But if I tell people anything other than the idea that you get fat because you make, you store more calories than you expend, I'm a quack. So that was the first mistake. And the second was this idea in the 60s when, see, American scientists, one of the lessons I learned, I became a historian of science through all of this. Um, whether I'm good or not depends on what you think of my books. Um, in science, the equipment we have, the technology we have, determines the questions you can ask. And the questions you can ask determine the answers you can get. And the answers you can get determine how you think about the problem. So every new technology always comes with new breakthroughs because we could ask new questions. You know, when, when you can only see the universe through our eyes, you only seeing visual light. As you start to create radio telescopes, you can listen to radio waves. And then ultraviolet and infrared telescopes, and you can start seeing the universe in different things. Now we have gravity wave detectors, and we can actually see gravity waves, or at least three of them. And so you could start asking different questions, you get different answers. 
And in nutrition, what we did post-World War II, beginning in the 1950s, we had these researchers, nutritionists, who wanted to know why there were such high degrees of heart disease in the United States. Why are American men particularly dying of heart attacks? So that's the question they set out to ask. And the answer they came to was saturated fat. We eat too much saturated fat. It wasn't the answer even to that question, but that's the question they were asking. That's what they could see. There's a story in, that I quote in my first book that I had actually learned from the physicists that's relevant to all science. It's the drunk in the street light idea. And so the idea is a guy's walking down the street at night and he comes along a drunk who's down on his hands and knees under a street light and the guy says to the drunk, what are you doing? And the drunk says, well, I'm looking for my keys. And the guy says, oh, is this where you lost your keys? And the drunk says, I don't know where I lost my keys. This is where the light is. <laughs> so if you live in the US and your patients are middle-aged executives, overweight, dying of heart disease, that's where the light is. And all you know how to do is measure cholesterol. Then you come up with a hypothesis that cholesterol causes heart disease and you look for mechanisms and you do studies and if you fall in love with your hypothesis, you end up with the wrong answer. In Europe, particularly in the remains of the British Empire, the British had an advantage because they had missionary and colonial hospitals all around the world. And all around the world, they were seeing the same thing, these doctors. They were seeing obesity and diabetes epidemics explode when populations shifted from whatever their traditional diet was to a Western urbanized diet, basically an American diet, the standard American diet. And so the British started asking that question, different question based on different observation. What's the cause of these epidemics we're seeing everywhere? And it doesn't matter what the baseline diet is. So some of these people, you see these epidemics in the Maasai, the, the Maasai warriors who are living basically on the blood and milk and meat and these very high saturated fat diets from the cattle they herd. When they move into the city, they get obesity and diabetes and hypertension and heart disease. And when Southeast Asians who are living on mostly rice and, and, and very low fat fish and soy move into the cities, they get obesity, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and it doesn't matter what the baseline diet is. It could be South Pacific Islanders, it could be Inuits, it could be anyone, but it associates with the Western diet and lifestyle for those who think it's sedentary behavior. So that was the question that the British set out to answer, and they came to a different answer, sugar and flour. You add sugar and flour, white flour to any diet, you get obesity, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, cancer, dementia. They're all associated with obesity and diabetes. And it turned out there was a whole line of research in all these fields linking these diseases to insulin signaling. So in obesity, it turned out that the hormone that regulates, fundamentally regulates how much fat you carry in your body is insulin. So type 1 diabetics who have an absence of lack insulin will die emaciated if they don't get insulin therapy. They can't store calories as fat because they don't have the insulin to do it. And type 2 diabetics, the common form of the disease that associates with weight and age, they have too much insulin because they're what's called insulin resistant. So they have too much insulin and they tend to be overweight and obese. So insulin directly links diet to obesity and insulin responds to the carbohydrate content of the diet. In fact, fat is the one nutrient that doesn't stimulate insulin deficiency. So I was in this weird place. Here I am, this investigative journalist who just set out to sort of knock down the food police on one level. I couldn't believe I hadn't eaten an avocado for a decade. <laughs> Excuse me. And now suddenly I have an alternative hypothesis. And worse, it's an alternative hypothesis that makes sense. And you can test it. So since the 1960s, there had been very popular diets that basically took out the carbohydrates and replaced them with fat. And even if the diet doctors didn't know it, they were basically lowering insulin levels as low as you can go. And they're very effective. And actually, I tried. So the Atkins diet is the most famous. And it was pilloried because it was a high-fat diet, high-saturated fat diet at a time when our medical community started being convinced that saturated fat caused heart disease. But if saturated fat didn't cause heart disease, 
The question is, what happens if you don't worry about the saturated fat and remove the carbs, and people tend to lose weight effortlessly on these diets? I did it as an experiment. An economist at MIT challenged me to do it as an experiment. And I did, and it's pretty remarkable. Which, if it hadn't worked, by the way, would have biased me. Um, you know, if I had done it and gotten fatter, I would have questioned the hypothesis, but I did it and lost 25 pounds, and I thought, well, this makes sense. So, anyway, so this was the background of all of this. I wrote my first book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. It's 500 pages plus another 150 pages of endnotes and bibliography. It's, despite the faux diet book title, it's a dense sort of academic tome, um, hard read. And when I was done with it, my, I got emails from people saying, you know, could you really could you write a book that would, could be, this book changed my life, and I've given it to my father and my son, and, but it's unreadable. <laughs> so could you write a version that my father or son would actually read if I gave it to him? So I gave him, I wrote Why We Get Fat, which is the airplane reading version, and a month after it came out, I got an email from a, a family friend who said, you know, I was on a plane from New York to the Caribbean, and I read your book on the plane, and I haven't had a carbohydrate in a month since, and I thought, exactly, that's what we wanted. There was a problem, though. I'm arguing that carbohydrates cause obesity and diabetes, and there's a black swan, there's a counter-argument to that, which is all of Southeast Asia, right? The billion people who live on high-carb diets and don't get obese and diabetic, or didn't get obese and diabetic until recently. So there's a lot of ways to explain that observation. Um, maybe they got fat a thousand years ago. Buddha was heavy, so maybe they had their obesity and diabetes epidemics a thousand years ago, and they evolved, they adapted so they can tolerate the carb content of their diet, or maybe it's the sugar. Because Southeast Asians eat extraordinarily low levels of sugar. They're at least 100 years behind us in sugar consumption. It turns out they're about 100 years behind us in obesity and diabetes rates. And there was a train of evidence implicating sugar as the cause of this condition called insulin resistance. So um, sugar is different from all other carbohydrates, something that the diabetes specialists of the early 1920s didn't realize when they insisted sugar was benign, but when you eat starches or grains, they, they break down in your body to glucose, and the glucose is transported into your bloodstream, and it raises your blood sugar, so blood sugar is blood glucose, and it's metabolized by virtually every cell in your body. Sugar is half glucose and half fructose, and fructose is the sweetest of the carbohydrates. And it's fruit sugar, it's why fruit's sweet, because it has fructose in it. And the fructose is metabolized, well, I would have said up until a week ago, I would have said it's metabolized primarily in your liver. It may be metabolized first in your small intestines, and at least in rats, and then in your liver. And the problem is your liver evolved to see very little fructose. It evolved to see the fructose in fruit which might be five or eight percent of the carbohydrate content of an apple or an orange, and the fruit would be in season one or two months a year, and that's it. And then you would have to eat the whole apple and the orange to get the fruit, to get the fructose. So then you'd have to digest the fructose, and it would be slow to digest. So it might take you, if you were going to eat, uh, well, eight ounces of apple juice is a sugar equivalent of about three medium-sized apples, so you could drink the apple juice in a 20 seconds post-workout. If you were to eat it as apples, you might eat those apples over the course of an hour, and then you might digest them over the course of another couple hours. And so basically your liver is seeing a load of fructose it never evolved to see. This is kind of the concept behind it. And just like any device, any machine that's asked to do a job, it was never asked to do, never designed to do, it does it poorly. And it converts the fructose into fat, and it ships the fat out to your body, and it seems there's an argument that you know, a hypothesis and experiments to back it up that this fructose effect in the liver causes fatty liver disease, and we have an epidemic of fatty liver disease. And that, in turn, causes um, insulin resistance. So type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance, and there's a link between insulin resistance and heart disease and type 2 diabetes and hypertension and cancer and dementia and all these other diseases.
So basically, I said to myself, somebody's got to write this book, and I might as well be the one to do it, if I can get a paycheck, because <laughs> journalists have to get paid too. So that's the genesis of the case against sugar, and that's the argument I'm making. The question is, what's the cause of these obesity and diabetes epidemics worldwide? The uh, World Health, Director General of the World Health Organization back a year and a half ago in a, called these epidemics a slow motion disaster and predicted that with complete certainty that public health organizations like her would fail to reverse them. I mean, it was a shocking prediction. And one of the reasons I would argue they failed to predict it is because they're going about it the wrong way. They're telling people who are getting obese and diabetic to eat less and exercise more. And eating less often means eating less fat because fat has such dense calories where they should be saying don't eat sugar and don't eat white flour in effect, don't eat refined grains. So they're two entirely different ways to address it, and they're based on entirely different paradigms of how you think about these diseases. So that's the, that's the case against sugar that I'm making in this book, is the science behind that. And in order to explain the science, I have to talk about the history. Because you have to answer the question, why is it that a journalist is making this argument in 2017 when it seems pretty obvious? that we're eating crazy amounts of sugar and they should be that, you know. I mean, the world kind of divides into two groups. People say, well, of course sugar is a problem. And people who say, no, it's all about calories. The experts, the authorities still say it's about how much we eat, not what we eat. There's a, a line, a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. So that was the logic. I would like to read a little bit, if you guys wouldn't mind. What I need is a book. <laughs> so in writing this book, I wanted to talk about the history. Um, you can't write about sugar and not address the slave trade, for instance and how sugar spread around the world in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. And it just it saturated diets with such speed. that It's a fascinating phenomenon. Um, and it did so when a lot of these sort of drug foods were spreading around the world, or drugs. So tobacco and caffeine and alcohol and chocolate and opium, and they're all spread. I mean, they, they were the oil of the 17th, 18th century, whole empires were built on it. But in order to discuss this, I had to discuss, are we talking about a drug or are we talking about a food? Because it's, de it's definitely different than other drugs. The experience is different than other drugs, but there are drug-like aspects to the substance. And those of you who have young kids, um, I should say, by the way, that the two things that inform my writing of this book that I couldn't avoid, so writers come to books with a context and with um, biases. So my context and my bias, I was a cigarette smoker, and it took me 20 years to quit. So I know what it's like having something in your life that you can't imagine living without. I also know what it's like getting to the point where you can't imagine ever having done it to begin with, even though the years in between can be miserable. Um, and then I have, I, had, I have children, and they were small, and life would be a lot easier without sugar, um, whether they're addicted or not. So this first chapter of the book, I have a long um, prologue, and the first chapter is called Drug or Food. And it starts with two epigraphs. Um, probably a cardinal sin to start with two quotes from writers who are better than you are. Um, so the first is from Roald Dahl, Boy, Tales of Childhood, which is memoirs, was written in 1984, and he said, the sweet shop in Landoff in the year of 1923 was the very center of our lives. To us it was what a bar is to a drunk or a church is to a bishop. Without it there would have been little to live for. Sweets were our life blood. And then the second is from Michael Pollan, uh, Botany of Desire in 2001. 
And Michael said, imagine a moment when the sensation of honey or sugar on the tongue was an astonishment, a kind of intoxication. The closest I've ever come to recovering such a sense of sweetness was secondhand, though it left a powerful impression on me, even so. I'm thinking of my son's first experience of sugar, the icing on the cake at his first birthday. I have only the testimony of Isaac's face to go by, that and his fierceness to repeat the experience. But it was plain that his first encounter with sugar had intoxicated him, was in fact an ecstasy in the literal sense of that word. That is, he was beside himself with the pleasure of it, no longer here with me in space and time in quite the same way it had been just a moment before. See, I told you, I'll never get that kind of laugh for my praise. <laughs> Between bites, Isaac gazed up at me in amazement. He was on my lap, and I was delivering the ambrosial forkfuls to his gaping mouth, as if to exclaim, your world contains this? <laughs> From this day forward, I shall dedicate my life to it. So what if Roald Dahl and Michael Pollan are right that the taste of sugar on the tongue can be a kind of intoxication? Doesn't it suggest the possibility that sugar itself is an intoxicant, a drug? Imagine a drug that can infuse us with energy and can do so when taken by mouth. It doesn't have to be injected, smoked, or snorted for us to experience its sublime and soothing effects. Imagine that it mixes well with virtually every food, and particularly liquids, and that when given to infants, it provokes a feeling of pleasure so profound and intense that its pursuit becomes a driving force throughout their lives. Overconsumption of this drug may have long-term side effects, but there are none in the short term, no staggering or dizziness, no slurring of speech, no passing out or drifting away, no heart palpitations or respiratory distress. When it is given to children, its effects may be only more extreme variations on the apparently natural emotional roller coaster of childhood, from the initial intoxication to the tantrums and whining of what may or may not be withdrawal a few hours later. More than anything, our imaginary drug makes children happy, at least for a period during which they're consuming it. It calms their distress, eases their pain, focuses their attention, and then leaves them excited and full of joy until the dose wears off. The only downside is that children will come to expect another dose, perhaps to demand it on a regular basis. How long would it be before parents took to using our imaginary drug to calm their children when necessary, to alleviate pain, to prevent outbursts of unhappiness, or to distract attention? And once the drug became identified with pleasure, how long before it was used to celebrate birthdays, a soccer game, good grades at school? How long before it became a way to communicate love and celebrate happiness? How long before no gathering of family and friends was complete without it, before major holidays and celebrations were defined in part by the use of this drug to assure pleasure? How long would it be before the underprivileged of the world would happily spend what little money they had on this drug rather than on nutritious meals for their families? How long would it be before this drug, as the anthropologist Sidney Mintz said about sugar, demonstrated a, quote, near invulnerability to moral attack, before even a writing a book such as this one was perceived as a nutritional equivalent of stealing Christmas. By the way, I wanted to call this book Stealing Christmas, the case, the case against sugar. And my editors vetoed it. And the good thing is a lot, I, I would tell people this, and many of them didn't get the Grinch um, metaphor, illusion. I also, that's a thought experiment I just did, and physicists would call it a Gedanken experiment because physicists like fancy words for simple concepts. Um, when I first wrote that, I thought I can't use this in the book. It's playing my hand too much. It's just, you know, I've got to appear. I, I admit to having a bias, but I can't, I don't want to hammer it home. The world is full of books that hammer the bias home. I want to just lay it out there. And then I have a friend who's a, a colleague on my not-for-profit who's about the best scientist I know in the nutrition obesity field, who's a cranky old man. And <laughs> I sent it to him and I said, can I use this? And he said, that's your opening paragraph, Gary. I don't know. So it is. Okay, so what is it about the experience of consuming sugar and sweets, particularly during childhood, that invokes so readily the comparison to a drug? I have children, still relatively young, and I believe raising them would be a far easier job if sugar and sweets were not an option. Managing their sugar consumption did not seem to be a constant theme in our parental responsibilities. That was a Michael Pollan line, by the way, that I stole from him. <coughs> but I told him I stole it from him. 
Even those who vigorously defend the place of sugar and sweets in modern diets, an innocent moment of pleasure, a bomb amid the stress of life, as a British journalist Tim Richardson has written, acknowledge that this does not include allowing children to eat as many sweets as they want at any time, and that most parents will want to ration their children's sweets. But why is it necessary? Children crave many things, Pokemon cards, Star Wars paraphernalia, Dora the Explorer backpacks. Many foods taste good to them. What is it about sweets that makes them so uniquely in need of rationing? Which is another way of asking whether the comparison to drugs of abuse is a valid one. I have to digress for a moment. Again, the two things we ration as a parent is sweets and screen time, right? What is it about screen time? And am I gonna have to write a book in 20 years? assuming my diet hasn't killed me, um, <clears throat> explaining what we've done to this experimental generation of children that we're raising who are, you know, clearly as addicted to screens. Anyway, digression. This is of more than academic interest because the response of entire populations to sugar has been effectively identical to that of children. Once populations are exposed, they consume as much sugar as they can easily procure, although there may be natural limits set by culture and current attitudes about food. <clears throat> the primary barrier to more consumption, up to the point where populations become obese and diabetic and then perhaps beyond, has tended to be availability and price. As the price of a pound of sugar has dropped over the centuries from the equivalent of 360 eggs in the 13th to two in the early decades of the 20th, the amount of sugar consumed has steadily, inexorably climbed. In 1934, while sales of candy continued to increase during the Great Depression, the New York Times commented, quote, the Depression proved that people wanted candy, that as long as they had any money at all, they would buy it. During those brief periods of time during which sugar production surpassed our ability to consume it, the sugar industry and purveyors of sugar-rich products have worked diligently to increase demand and at least until recently have succeeded. The critical question, what scientists debate, as a journalist and historian Charles C. Mann has elegantly put it, is whether sugar is actually an addictive substance or if people just act like it is. So Charles Mann is a friend of mine also, um, brilliant historian journalist. Um, he's got a new book out called The ah, Prophet, and I can't remember what it's called, brilliant book. I mean, he's just, he is so good that I can't read his books because, <laughs> because they depress me, they make me feel like a hack. So I've written, I'm struggling with this book, okay? It's, I always have trouble writing. Sisyphus is my role model. It's like, it's just, it's hard for me to write. I finally get this first chapter written on drug or food. It's about 4,000 words, and I realize that, that Cam, is his name, has, in his the then latest book, 1493, had a chapter on how sugar spread around the world after Columbus, and he has a chapter about the sugar industry. And I have to read it, because he's so good. And I read it, and he has this line that scientists debate amongst themselves whether sugar is an addictive substance or people just act like it is. And I go, he just said in 14 words what I said in 4,000. <laughs> I could throw out my first chapter. <laughs> in which case I'm nowhere, I'm back at the bottom of the hill with the boulder, or I could quote Cam over and over again and give him credit. So again, just the writerly quote him, and then the fact that I'm now gonna basically reiterate the next 3,800 words, what he said in 14, is something I hope I'm, you know. Anyway. Okay, certainly this question is not easy to answer. Certainly people in populations have acted as though sugar is addictive, but science provides no definitive evidence. Until recently, nutritionists studying sugar did so from the natural perspective of viewing sugar as a nutrient to carbohydrate, nothing more. They occasionally argued about whether or not it might play a role in diabetes or heart disease, but not about whether it triggered a response in the brain or body that made us want to consume it in excess. That was not their area of interest. The funerologists and psychologists interested in probing the sweet tooth phenomena or why we might need to ration our sugar consumption so as not to eat it to excess did so typically from the perspective of how these sugars compared with other drugs of abuse, in which the mechanism of addiction is now relatively well understood. Lately, this comparison has received more attention as the public health community has looked to ration our sugar consumption as a population and has thus considered the possibility that one way to do that, as with cigarettes, is to establish that they are indeed addictive. These sugars are very likely unique in that they are both a nutrient and a psychoactive substance, 
with some addictive characteristics. You said 10 minutes. Should I, can I do another page and a half? Yeah. Susan? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll take that as an advice. So historians have often considered the sugar as a drug metaphor to be an apt one. That sugars, particularly highly refined sucrose, produce peculiar physiological effects is well known, wrote the late Sidney Mintz, whose 1985 book, Sweetness and Power, is one of two seminal English language histories of sugar on which other more recent writers on the subject, including myself, heavily rely. But these effects are neither as visible nor as long-lasting as those of alcohol or caffeinated beverages, quote, the first use of which can trigger rapid changes in respiration, heartbeat, skin color, and so on. Mintz has argued that a primary reason that through the centuries sugar has escaped religious-based criticism of the kind pronounced on tea, coffee, rum, and even chocolate is that whatever conspicuous behavioral changes may occur when infants consume sugar did not cause the kind of flushing, staggering, dizziness, euphoria, changes in the pitch of the voice, slurring of speech, visibly intensified physical activity, or any of the other cues associated with the ingestion of these other drugs. As this book will argue, sugar appears to be a substance that causes pleasure with a price that is difficult to discern immediately and paid in full only years or decades later. With no visible, directly noticeable consequences, as Min says, questions of, quote, long-term nutritive or medical consequences went unasked and unanswered. Most of us today will never know if we suffer even subtle withdrawal symptoms from sugar because we'll never go long enough without sugar to find out. <laughs> Mints and other sugar historians consider the drug comparison to be so fitting in part because sugars want to have a handful of drug foods, to use Mintz's term, that came out of the tropics and on which European empires were built from the 16th century onward, the others being tea, coffee, chocolate, rum, and tobacco. Its history is ultimately linked to that of these other drugs. Rum is distilled, of course, from sugar cane, whereas tea, coffee, and chocolate were not consumed with sweeteners in their regions of origin. In the 17th century, however, once sugar was added as a sweetener and prices allowed it, the consumption of these substances in Europe exploded. Sugar was used to sweeten liquors and wine in Europe as early as the 14th century, even cannabis preparations in India, and opium-based wines and syrups included sugar as a major ingredient. Cola nuts containing both caffeine and traces of a milder stimulant called theobromine became a product of universal consumption in the late 19th century, first as coca-infused wine in France, and then as the original mixture of cocaine and caffeine of Coca-Cola, with sugar added to mask the bitterness of the other two substances. The removal of the cocaine in the first years of the 20th century seemed to have little influence on Coca-Cola's ability to become, as one journalist described in 1938, the, quote, sublimated essence of all that America stands for, the single most widely distributed product on the planet and the second most recognizable word on earth, OK, being the first. Uh, it's not a coincidence that John Pemberton, the inventor of Coca-Cola, had a morphine addiction that he'd acquired after being wounded in the Civil War. Coca-Cola was one of several patent medicines he invented to help wean him off the harder drug. Like Coca-Cola enables its partakers to undergo long fast and fatigue, read one article in 1884. Two drugs so closely related in their physiological properties cannot fail to command early universal attention. Okay, let's leave it at that. And, um, thank you. Questions? Questions. We now have time for questions. Um, yes. And you'll have to speak up because I'm a little hard of hearing. funny because I, I wrote a, an op-ed in the New York Times about uh, breaking the sugar addiction and I talked about the problems people have with grandparents, right, whose job is basically to give your kids the sugar that you won't give them. That's how you win their love, right? And, you know, it's a great, it's like a contract that we allow to go on. It's like, go to, my wife even did a kid's book when she was younger with the, the whole point of the book was Coco going to grandmother's house where eventually there's, you know, lemonade and cookies. 
Um, I wrote this article and I got a call from my mother-in-law who <laughs> said, are you thinking of me when you're writing that? I said, well, yeah. Um, anyway, so I don't know, in our house, I can tell you what we do, which is we don't, we don't have sodas, we don't have fruit juices. So in my world, fruit juice is basically Coca-Cola with vitamins. Um, it's, you know, again, one of the horrible mistakes I think the nutrition community made was this idea that we could drink, you know, orange, we should drink orange juice and apple juice every day, and it's healthy because of the vitamin content when you're getting this basically dose of liquid sugar. Um, You know, we go easy on desserts. It's funny, my kids come back, we spend 10 days with the grandparents and it comes back, it takes them three weeks to ratchet their sweet tooth back down to what it should be. So about 10 days into this, I'm making dinner for my boys, my wife is out with some friends and my youngest son, Nick, says, is there dessert tonight? And my oldest son, Harry, goes, Dad, Nick, it's Dad, man. <laughs> it's like, what are you thinking? Um, you know, I haven't told my, I mean, if my wife wants to tell her mother to go easy on the sugar, that's okay. I can't do that. Um, they know how I feel about it. It's, you know, um, it's a slow process. Um, I let my kids have some sugar because, and there's some fights I just don't fight because I'm, pretty sure that we don't have obesity and diabetes running in the family, so I'm not really worried about it. I've also interviewed enough people and enough doctors over the years that I think when they get old enough to make their own decisions, um, if they want to you know, get sugar out of their diet entirely, they could reverse most of the damage that I think it'll be doing. But, you know, it's a problem. It's either you go to I mean, it's funny, I do these interviews, I go to a radio show, the first thing they ask me, do you want a cup of coffee, would you like sugar, or milk, cream, and then they go, <laughs> you know, then they offer you candy, or they take you into a green room where there's donuts, or, you know, I mean, it is, it's so much a part of our culture, but the message is getting across, it's definitely getting easier to take a stand without being perceived as, you know, uh, some kind of crazy health seller, so. Um, okay, so what's the correlation between diet drinks and obesity? And the question is, there's a pretty high correlation, but then if you think about it, you don't know what's cause and what's effect. So the people who tend to drink diet sodas are the ones who are worried about gaining weight. Um, I have a friend who's an emeritus professor of epidemiology at UCLA, and he's about six foot four and 180, and he spends about 250 days a year skiing. And um, whenever we get together, he orders three desserts for you know, a meal because he can do it. And he actually thinks I'm right, but he wants to, he's always making some point about. So there's a high correlation. There is, I know people who are absolutely convinced that artificial sweeteners also stimulate insulin secretion. Basically, they fool your body into thinking sweets are coming and your body prepares in the same way it would for sweets. And that could be true, but the research is ambivalent. In general, I think in an ideal world, people get rid of their sweet tooth. And you stop sweetening things. And if you do it, and I've done it, and just, you know, again, it's the world becomes a different place. So you get your pleasure from other things in the diet. Um, but a lot of people can't do that. And then I think sweeteners are kind of a necessity. But if they switch from sweets to sweeteners and they don't feel any profound difference, they don't see any profound difference in their weight, I would say, well, then get rid of the sweeteners and see what's happening. Is there any movement to stop, um, like, Girl Scout cookies? <laughs> Wait. It's funny because I recently, I'm giving a talk at Apple and Cupertino in March, and I was scheduled for March 1st, but March is International Women's Month, and they were bringing in the first 
a uh, Hispanic astronaut who is now head of the Girl Scouts, and they wanted to use the auditorium. And I said, I'm okay, I'm absolutely fine with that as long as they're not selling or giving away Girl Scout cookies. Um, there's a lot of grassroots movements. I mean, there's a lot of mothers who are trying to do something about it, and I suspect, you know, there's more in places like Berkeley and Oakland than there are in Mississippi. But, um, um, you know, it's... it's Again, it's tough. I mean, it's just, it's, that's tough. And the other thing is, you know, again, sugar is, these sweets are so much a part of our celebrations that, you know, what's a birthday without a birthday cake? And so people have to basically relearn how to give joy to their kids. I mean, it's funny, I think my wife has spoiled our sons because they'll go shopping together, and every time they go shopping, they'll come back with $20 worth of Pokemon cards or something. And her, she says, well, I have to go shopping. They're going to have to come with me because I can't leave them at home, and would you prefer I buy them an ice cream cone? You know, so we get them $20 in Pokemon cards. It's, um, we have a problem, yeah. And if you can repeat the question, too. Yes, I, they, clearly they heard it. That, that was my, pardon me? Did I have a wedding cake? Yes, we had a wedding cake, but I hadn't written my sugar book. <laughs> but we probably would have had a wedding cake even if I had. Like I said, there's some fights. I am not the only parent in this household or the only, you know, individual. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is, the question is, or the statement is, yeah, sugar is in everything, and it's true. It's in virtually every process. Sugar's in, one of the problems is sugar is incredibly useful as a food additive. I mean, it's a preservative. It's a, it gives mouthfeel to, to drinks. It gives, I mean, there's sugar in bacon. They cure sugar with bacon in it because it, 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 it cuts the, the salt a bit. I mean, it's just, it's incredibly useful. But you can get rid of the, if you get rid of the drinks, the sugary beverages, and the sweets, you're probably getting rid of 80 to 85% of the harmful stuff. And on some level, every, it's funny, this is one thing virtually every diet, major diet has in common, regardless of whether it's, you call it a low-fat diet or a low-carb diet, or they get rid of, process, they tell you not to buy processed foods. You know, this, it's a line about buying from the outside the super, the outside aisles of the supermarket, and those are the aisles basically which don't have sugary foods in them, except for the bakery section. Um, so, but yeah, sugar is in everything. I think the thing is, though, sugar consumption in this country peaked in 1999. Um, it's been coming, and the, the, I don't think it's a coincidence that the obesity epidemic started getting a lot of publicity in 1998. And sugary beverage consumption peaked in 1999. Even with all the energy drinks and all that, it's still been coming downward. And so the message is out there, and pretty clearly the industry knows the message is out there. Um, I think they see the writing on the wall. They're putting out lower sugar products. They're actually saying things on their products now that they never would have said before, like low sugar or no sugar, when it used to be low calorie or no calorie, because they didn't want to say no sugar because that would imply it had artificial sweeteners in it. But now they're thinking the trade-off's worth it. So the message is getting out there. And you know, the truth is you could probably be perfectly healthy you know, if you're, the only sources of sugar in your diet are the sugars and the, you know, better foods, better processed foods. But, again, most people don't do that. Yeah. At the beginning, you, you give some certain professions, they say they were good and bad professionals. But it, when you mention the scientists, you say there are some good scientists and bad scientists. Did you, if you make, No. Um, okay, so the question is, what did I mean when I talk about good scientists and bad scientists? And am I talking about their ethics? I'm talking about their ability to establish reliable knowledge about the universe. The, so it's just coming back to this line about the first principle is you must not fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. And the good scientists are the ones who are terrified of fooling themselves. <laughs> 
Everything they think about is how can I be fooling myself? How can I be wrong? How can I screw it up? How can I test it? How can I retest it? Who can I get to test it for me? Who can I get to retest it? Where did I? Surely I made a mistake. Somebody's got to point it out to me. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a slow and drawn out and expensive process and it's what you have to do to, to get reliable knowledge. And the bad scientists are the ones who think, well, I did the study and this is what I found and must be true. Or I'm going to say it was true because that's how I get funding. And if I don't say it's true, if I say more research is necessary, I'm not going to get funding or there are, you know, so it's sort of, it's a mindset. It's a, the, every book I've written on some point is, to me, what I'm obsessed with is still this question of how to get the right answer and how easy it is to get the wrong answer in science. And every book I've written has been about good science and bad science. They sell a lot better when they're about diet than when they're about physics. <laughs> But it's all the same theme, and it's all the same thing, and it's like, what are the alternative hypotheses? So a good scientist is thinking not just about his own hypothesis, saturated fat causes heart disease, but what about all the other hypotheses? Because the only evidence that's really valuable is the evidence that, that one hypothesis that, that refutes hypotheses. So it's a, there's a whole mindset, culture that goes to doing good science. And one of the subtexts of my book is that, that culture just doesn't exist in the fields of nutrition and obesity. It, it, it crossed the Atlantic from Germany and Austrian physics because we had bombs to build and nuclear, you know, a Cold War to fight and we embraced, if you look at the history of the Manhattan Project, it was all basically, I mean, it was dominated by European emigres, most of them Jews. Um, when I was doing my first book on physics in CERN outside of Geneva, the European physicists used to say the best thing that ever happened to American science was Hitler. He drove all these brilliant Europeans to the U.S. and we went from being a backwater of science. In post-war, we had the money to fund science when nobody else did, so we became the leading, the, the great powerhouse of science that we grew up knowing. But it was all based on this sort of European thinking and culture, and it crossed the Atlantic in biology, too. The leaders in the molecular revolution in biology were physicists, for the most part. Um, but in these other fields, nutrition and public health, they wanted nothing to do with them. It's a fascinating history because, for instance, Ivy League schools had policies in place to, so they wouldn't be overrun by Jewish emigres from World War, both students and faculty. And so these people, these brilliant physiologists and doctors and researchers came to the U.S. and didn't get jobs, and they just kept moving west. And one of the reasons why the University of California has such a great school system is because we embrace them. When the Ivy League people that wanted nothing to do with these people, and that culture still exists. And I still, to this day, you'll find better medical science, in my mind, in California than in the Boston, New York, Philadelphia corridor, and better medical science in Israel surprisingly good medical science in Israel, because they got a lot of them, too. Well, I just want to say I agree with oh. what you're saying, and, um, and very supportive of the case of Malcolm Hannon, should I say that So the question is, do I get backlash from my um, sugar argument? The answer is no, surprisingly. Sugar, I'm safe. Um, and even the sugar industry doesn't seem to care that I exist. All day. They've always been brilliant at, at, at public relations. And um, it's good to just ignore your critics um, for the most part, because if you pay attention to them, you build them up. Um, I get a lot of push back from my other nutrition work where I'm arguing that the nutrition obesity communities have made fundamental errors, like this idea about the cause of obesity not being, uh, you know, uh, how much we eat and exercise. Uh, and there are particular people out there who have sort of decided that they're going to be the defenders of the conventional wisdom against me. Most of the community, I mean, I'm winning over, I'm, I'm getting there. It's been a long, hard slog because I'm a journalist, I'm an outsider. Um, so 
you know, I've won over, there's a couple of journals, like the British Medical Journal, they like my work and they consider me, you know, it's sort of an authority despite just being a journalist, but it's a slow job and then there's always, you know, people who are willing to just say I'm wrong or I'm naive. With the Sugar Book, it was funny, I got terrific reviews, I mean, wonderful, front page New York Times book review, which even at 60 was like, you know, life came true. And then finally the New Yorker reviews me, which is one magazine I want to write for, and I get this review by Jerome Grobman, who's a Harvard professor of medicine, and he could not have been more condescendingly dismissive. <laughs> I mean, it was like, <laughs> I haven't, I had to stop reading the New Yorker, which is the one magazine I really like. I mean, it's, anyway. Okay, so the question is when you mix sugar with fat, this is a fascinating question because one of the issues is how quickly you digest the carbohydrate. So I talked about the problem with the sugary beverages in my mind is you're basically dumping it on your liver. So if you slow it, and this, there's a concept called the glycemic index that you guys have probably heard about. So the lower the glycemic index, the more slowly you digest it, the more slowly the blood sugar rises. So when you mix a carbohydrate with fat, you slow down the the speed of digestion. So that lowers the glycemic index. And the same thing happens with sugar. So, but mixing it with fat, they, the problem is you store the fat. So we store the fat immediately. So this is one of the places where the obesity community got it wrong. They said that you can show actually that you store the fat that you eat immediately and it's very easy to store the calories from fat as fat. So your body does that. So the idea was if you don't eat as much fat, you won't get as much fat, right? But it turns out that it's the carbohydrates through insulin that's regulating the use of that fat. So even though it's the fat that is storing, it's the carbohydrates that are controlling it. So in order to store less fat, you have to get rid of the carbs, not the fat. So the answer is, I don't know. The way to look at it, so my, our cupboards are full of health food bars, which are basically low-fat candy bars, right? So they still have sugar in it, maybe not quite as much. So a Snickers bar, which is a high-fat candy bar, would be digest slowly. So we could actually do a clinical trial <laughs> where we could take 100 kids and give 50 of them Snickers bars, which I got to grow up eating and loved, and the other 50, you know, nature's way and see what happens, but I actually don't know what the answer is. The fat should slow down the digestion, but it could make the fat storage problem worse. I have to... Okay, so question, is there any sort of reasonably good research that tells us what's a safe level of sugar? So several health organizations are now doing that. The World Health Organization, the American Heart Association are setting limits that are pretty low. It's like 10 grams of sugar, you know, uh, two thirds of a Coke of, can of Coke a day and less for kids and they have no idea. Um, so the problem is, in the last chapter of my book is basically a meditation on this concept. Because so here's the idea: if obesity and the, if eating sugar causes obesity and diabetes, so it's a similar causality. I'm saying to cigarettes and lung cancer. So you have cigarettes in the in a world: uh, one in ten people who smoke are going to get lung cancer. No cigarettes. It's like one in a hundred, one in a thousand people. And you have sugar in the world. Actually, one in three are going to get obese, and one in ten are going to get diabetic, no sugar. Those numbers are infinitesimal. So we're going to say it's the same causality. We don't tell people to smoke less, okay? We don't say smoke in moderation. We don't say, and clearly, there's a point where you've smoked one cigarette too much. You know, you smoke 10,000 cigarettes, you're fine, and the 10,000th and first, some mutagenic phenomena has occurred in your cell, and there's no going back, and you're doomed. But we still don't tell people to cut back or smoke less. We say don't smoke. So if sugar causes obesity and diabetes, how good would the research have to be for you, especially to say to, say to your kid, well, you're, okay, you only had eight grams today, you're still good. 
You know, I, I don't know what the answer is. If it's causing, especially diabetes, which is a, you know, it's a, it's a burdensome chronic disease that will shorten their lives. You know, what I want to tell them is don't eat sugar, but I don't force that because I think they're basic, they are probably eating a perfectly safe level. Well, but again, that, even that's tricky. And then there's another issue, and I'm going to ask you guys about it. Some, oh, um, you could also say just limit your carbohydrates and include the sugar in the carbohydrates. And so that was kind of the question. So here's the point. My wife, we can go out to a nice restaurant. She can order dessert. And she can have two bites and push the dessert away and never think of it again. Okay? I'm virtuous, right? So I don't order the dessert. But I know she ordered the dessert, and it looks good. <laughs> So I'm going to think about it for a while, and then I'm going to have a bite. And then as soon as I have a bite, I'm having this conversation with the dessert, you know, like the, <laughs> And anything else that's going on at the table is faded into, like, the volume is cut down. It's me and the dessert are the universe. <laughs> and I'm thinking about, like, I want it. And can I get a waitress to come and take it off the table before I finish it? And can I eat a second bite? And if I can't find a waitress, I'm going to have a second bite while it's still sort of in front of her. And then eventually I'm going to go, you know, and it's gone in like five seconds. And when it's gone, it's not like my sweet taste has been sated. Okay, I think a lot about this now. I'm just as hungry for sugar as I ever was. I just realized that if I have two or three, I'm going to regret it. So there's a kind of conscious ability once it's out of sight. This is why I think it's different than other drugs, because if, as a smoker, you have a cigarette, you don't want another one for an hour or two, unless you're a chain smoker, but it doesn't fuel your urge. So my question is, how many of you are like me? And how many of you are like my wife, where it's like, yeah, it's about the average. I mean, usually it's a little, and I think those of you who are like my wife can't understand what it's like to be us. So for me, <laughs> it's easier to not eat any sugar. It's just, and my cravings, as again, it's hard to tell what's a sort of a placebo effect or what's not. But when I start having sugar, it starts getting easier. There's a slippery slope aspect to it. So it starts to become once a week to once every other day to then, oh, what the hell. The next thing you know, you've had sugar every day for the past week. Whereas if I don't have sugar, it's pretty easy to not have sugar. But that's probably, that, you know, anyway, yes. Okay, so the question is, I'm going to repeat the question even though I can't answer it. <laughs> yeah, it was a good question. Why do you think in the United States, an educated country, we allow stuff to be put in our food that other countries don't? And this is just not my area of expertise. Um, and I try to stay very limited to my area of expertise. All right, let's go And on. this will be the last question. And one thing, Mr. Tobbs, in support of his message, I want to allow enough time for you to buy the book and speak with him. And we're going to skip the coffee reception so there's no temptation for sugar. So. <laughs> and I can't answer questions while I'm signing books. So. Wait, what was the answer? I didn't. Money. Okay. What about the virtues of dark dark chocolate and a little red wine? Okay. What about the virtues of dark chocolate and a little red wine? Um, I actually eat a uh, hundred percent chocolate without sweeteners. Uh, my wife, when I tell her that it's a really good hundred percent chocolate, she says, "Oh, that means it tastes like cardboard, but not bitter, <laughs> not bitter cardboard." Um, you know, here's the, here's the thing. I can't answer, which is life is not just about maximizing your longevity. It's about enjoying it. Okay? And I, so one of the things, you know, there's a whole other, there's four other lectures where I could talk about, again, why we get fat and the, what happens when you give up carbohydrates and you eat fats instead. So I'm one of these people who don't eat carbs. I eat a lot of 
butter and bacon and red meat, and I have no idea if I'm killing myself. I hope not. I don't think so, but I get a lot of joy from, you know, buttery. It's like French food without the bread and the potatoes. Um, Julia Child's era. Um, the red wine is probably fine, but if you're trying to, if you're diabetic or you're obese, I mean, one of the ways I think about it is if you're diabetic and you have to cover it with insulin, you're probably better off not eating it. But are you happy or not eating? And that's a decision everyone makes differently. So anyway, thank you very much. Gary, thank you.